All right. Bergson, the holographic theory of mind. Part 58. Orc or revisited. So we're going to take a look again at orc or this time from a couple perspectives of mythologies. Quantum computing, a mythology at orc or's base, and also at the base, the QM measurement problem. And nope, Whitehead will not save this theory and the claim the only physical theory of consciousness, really? So let's take a look. Yes, we've already examined or, or in number 20. I'm sticking with that analysis. Number 20 is still worth doing, I retract nothing. And yes, this claim is a bit maddening, but to that later. What has happened since number 20? For me, well, way deeper looks into QM and the measurement problem. The whole number 40A, 45A, 45B, which this little talk here is predicated on, and quantum computing, number 29, and then amended in number 39, slides 33 to 38. So as I viewed this interview, this March 2021 interview, I was now struck by the massive problems in these two areas, QM and QC, that Stewart and Penrose seem to be just colliding over. These, in, in my humble opinion, pretty much well collapse or, or, or at least put a hurt on it. At the start, Stewart describes, it is the start of the interview, he describes how he got into microtubules while studying cell division in the lab. I kind of like Stewart's story here. He says at the time, in the early 70s, it was appreciated that these were in neurons. The neurons were full of them and they had a lattice structure. And it looked to me like a computer matrix because I was trying to figure out how computers work. Computers were new to me back then in the early 70s. So I looked inside neurons and I saw all these little structures that looked like computers that might be processing information and subserving consciousness below neurons. Now I note this as I found it interesting. We'll see that Stuart never actually leaves the brain as computer framework. I was there too in the early 70s when the computer metaphor of mind swept in. I figured out how computers work by immersing and programming, heavily immersing. When you actually do this, well, you get way more skeptical. Just saying. He knows that he spent about 20 years working on microtubules as classical information processing devices. He went to conferences, meetings, saying, hey, to understand the brain, you can't just think of a neuron as a one or a zero. You've got to go into a deeper level and get all this additional information. The AI people were saying that you have to have 10 to the 11th neurons switching at about 1,000 hertz or about 10 to the 16th operations per second. Singularity people, Kurzweil, they thought, get to 10 to the 16th, we'll have brain equivalence or consciousness, and then move right on to superiority. But Stewart told them, if you have the microtubule subunits, the MTs, about 1 billion per neuron, switching at 10 megahertz, you get 10 to the 16th operations per second for every neuron. And he says, the AI folks did not like this. But then he describes his enlightenment. So one day someone said, let's say you're right. How does this explain consciousness? How does that explain love, joy, envy, pinkness? What later became the hard problem according to David Chalmers. For Stu, I was a bit stunned. I realized I didn't know. And the same person suggested I read Penrose the Emperor's New Mind. This is about two years, I think, after he says the publication. Describing Penrose, he says, he was arguing that in the ghetto context, that to prove a theorem, you have to be outside the computational system. Penrose extrapolated that to understand anything, you have to be outside the computational system of the brain. Basically, as Stewart describes this, outside of the neurons firing 
or not firing. But that's not what it means to be outside the computational system. That's Stuart's gloss on it, which is not true. So to prove a theorem, you have to be outside the computational system. We must stop and let this register. What is the hallmark of a computational system? It's dis discrete states. There we have the, the read head of the Turing machine going through various states. It's in each state on the tape, moving back and forth. It's an abstract system that moves in discrete time from discrete state to discrete state to discrete state, where in effect, there is never more than one state, then the next, then the next. This is the time of the classic metaphysic, as we've noted over and over, discrete instants, discrete states. But what's the hallmark of Penrose's visual proof in Shadows of the Mind, subsequent to the um, Emperor book? Well, we've, we've noted it many times because he's talking about a computation that does not stop. He's folding hexagonal numbers into, first forming them into hexagons and folding them into three-sided cubes and stacking each successive three-sided cube over the previous cube, always getting a cubical number, 1 to 8 to 27 to 64. But it is an indivisible transformation, not divisible into states, such that the globality of the transformation over time can be perceived, and the invariance, that is, the cubicalness, the three-sidedness, is preserved across this transformation. One cannot perceive a global transformation, save in an indivisible flow, that is, in an indivisible time, not instance, not states. A continuous transformation is a bit insufficient to cover what is intended here. And I know what Penrose says to understand anything. It's not just proofs. But we were talking in continuous transformations in a perceptual modality, the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic. We've noted before one of Piaget's examples in the visual. The children is three to seven are shown a little tunnel. Three beads are moved to the tunnel. ABC, the tunnel's rotated from one to n times or semi-rotated, 180 degree rotations. And the child is asked, what order will the beads come out? After three rotations, after four rotations, after seven rotations, after eight rotations. There's an abstract generalization, the odd even rule. An odd number of turns, the order reverses. The even number of turns, the order stays the same. But they don't get that till age seven. In the meanwhile, from ages three to seven, they're working on improving visualizing of the semi-rotations. They'll come to a point, for example, where they can predict the result with three or four semi-turns or 180 degree rotations. But they are yet lost when asked to jump to say seven or eight. They cannot visualize this many half turns. So note, they're visualizing the way like crazy. For Piaget, the eventual achievement of this odd even rule or invariance, that is its concrete operation stage, is the result of schematizing these visual transformations until they become like a little schematic experiment that does not actually have to be fully performed. Again, the children must see the invariance over the, over the globality of this trans transformation. Now I know it, I keep picking this one because it's, it's easy to illustrate, but there are just tons of these in Piaget's books. But where is modality in orc or? Because again, we're just dealing with neurons, chemical flows, albeit microtubules. Same problem, where is mod modality in a computer, in a computer memory? But this perception of globality, this is why consciousness is required for cognition. But a position Stewart states later on in the interview is consciousness supervenes on cognition. In other words, cognition does not normally need consciousness. It's carried on without consciousness, and only if maybe something makes you uh, 
aware of that you're thinking about something do you get consciousness coming in this is just expressing AIs and cognitive sciences cluelessness with respect to the question why is consciousness needed they have no clue in their computer framework it is not needed they think but they cannot explain Piaget it's a mythology that they're explaining Piaget so neither Stuart nor Penrose have ever understood the implications of Penrose. So do they ever actually escape the computational system? No. To it, they simply add a totally magical component wrapped in an ill-founded appeal to QM and QC, quantum computing. Penrose's answer to what that outside was, says Stuart, got into his own view of QM and the measurement problem. He says, quote, and in QM, you have the superpositions of possibilities. You can have things in two places at the same time. And yet when you measure or observe them, they become one or the other. The very act of measurement, of, or some people thought, conscious observation caused the collapse of the wave function. He notes other ideas, the many worlds, decoherence, Bohm's theory, or this or that. They all have strong points, weak points, he notes. But he says what Roger did, which is kind of mind blowing, and still is after all these years, he explained superposition, which nobody else has even attempted to do, as far as I can tell. Nobody? This is a complete failure to either understand or at least acknowledge Bohm. Explain superposition is exactly what he did. More precisely, he addressed the entire measurement problem. And in doing this, superposition ceased to exist. Stuart goes on. How can something be in two places at the same time? How can it be here and here at the same time? Again, note the way he expresses this. He is reifying superposition, treating it as having an ontological, it is a physical, it is a real status. He later describes how he and Penrose tried to conceptualize a superposition of a protein and how many microtubules are needed for this. Again, this is all very much taking superposition as real. But this we will see in the measurement problem is exactly the question. So what did Penrose do? Well, Penrose, said Stu, appealed to general relativity and the curvature of space-time. He had now applied this to the micro level, to the microtubules. Being in two places at once was a separation in space-time. If they continue to separate, you'd have multiple worlds. But these separations are unstable. And after a time t, depending on the mass of the superposition, the mass of the microtubules, would self-collapse to one or the other, with t being inversely proportional to the amount of separation. Again, stop. What is going on here? So Penrose, we'll give him, say for the sake of argument, got rid of the observer created or measurement created collapse. But this is far from the only aspect of the measurement problem. What is the problem with the wave equation as both Schrodinger and Einstein saw it? It has no ontology, no comprehensible physics. What kind of physical thing, what ontology could the wave function psi possibly represent? Well, this is what we discussed in 45A and, and B, taking the uh, key from the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics by Travis Norrison, who uh, was recommended, to my mind, at least by uh, Adam Becker there in his What is Real? The, the only explication of Bell's theorem, the only true explication. Mathematically, psi is a function of a configuration space. It's an abstract space. 
if representing real fields like the electromagnetic field B and E, well, it becomes strange for B and E would not dwell in ordinary physical space. That is, you have a, a magnetic field and an electrical field that are not in ordinary physical space. So what is that? But rather in this abstract configuration space. This worried Schrodinger from the get-go. Lorenz, responding via letter to a copy of Schrodinger's paper, had this to say. If I had to choose now between your wave mechanics and the matrix mechanics, Heisenberg, I would give the preference to the former, that is Schrodinger's, because of its greater intuitive clarity. But get this, so long as one only has to deal with three coordinates, X, Y, and Z, in other words, standard three-dimensional space. If, however, there are more degrees of freedom, then I cannot interpret the waves and vibrations physically and I must therefore decide in favor of matrix mechanics. It is when you go to four, five, six, n dimensions, Lorentz can't deal with it because it has no physical reality. We can see how measurement and, and ontology are entwined. Even in the simple case in the left panel there with the one single blob, how does this wave function correspond to the kinds of physical objects we are describing. So we're looking there at the intensity of psi, that is, that blob is showing over time the um, concentration of probability, shall we say, of where uh, the particle is with, with this energy state, evolving over time t. So that's what we're looking at, and it's bringing in the movement of the particle as described by psi in its one-dimensional box there and as it's measured as the energy state of that particle is is measured by our pointer y sub n so that's what's being brought in on the right side of the panel there we, we see three of these blobs for the particle starting off with three possible energy states so showing the particle position x and the pointer value y. So this high intensity region of configuration space, that gray blob, it doesn't exactly look like a particle in a box and if it's some particular state. And as well, a pointer with some reasonably sharp location showing energy value in that state where each is moving in a one dimensional physical space. It's a blob, it's smeared out. And note here, it's, we're not just talking position. Stuart's two particles here and here. It's all properties. Here we're talking energy states. There's other properties. Schrodinger responded to Lorentz. His original idea for physically interpreting the meaning of the wave function, use the wave function to construct the mass or charge density for each particle separately, then add these together to get the total, say, charge density. This even in cases of n greater than two particles where the wave function is a function of a three n dimensional configuration space. Now note, just four particles equals 12 dimensions, three times n, to give, or to give a, uh, an idea of how abstract is the space and why Lorentz could no longer interpret things physically. Schrodinger eventually gave up on this picture. Schrodinger's equation implies that wave packet spread, like in the little picture up there from the center, the wave packet spreads to the periphery, to a perimeter, like a sphere. As time evolves, these nice little clouds, lumps of non-zero charge density, would diffuse into an increasingly blurry haze. This doesn't correspond to the relatively sharp macroscopic world. And the sharpness, Schrodinger was at pains to capture in the fundamental theory. But as Norse had noted, there are no other ideas. As Norse notes, if you say quantum mechanical wave function should be taken as corresponding in some sense to physical reality, as opposed, for example, to our incomplete knowledge or our ignorance, then explain in concrete, mundane detail how that alleged correspondence works. 
That's the problem. How do you get out of the ontology problem? That's the burden that's put on any theorist that's going to solve this. But this abstract configuration space is at the base of the nonsensical situations in quantum mechanics. The cat, dead or alive, this is physically nonsensical. Einstein's gunpowder barrel exploded and not exploded simultaneously. Nonsensical, physically. All of these thought situations were meant as reductios, reductios ad absurdum. They were not enshrining quantum weirdness. They're not enshrining it. Rather, these illustrated something deeply wrong with quantum mechanics. Again, the lack of physical reality of ontological status. So Penrose defeated this problem. Did he turn space time into a configuration space, a space of n dimensions? Did he deal with all properties as well as position? How? In other words, you have to solve the entire measurement problem, like Bohm did, not some piece, supposedly. And as we'll see, this ontology problem lies at the base of the problems of implementing a quantum computer, in my humble opinion. So Stuart continued with respect to Penrose's objective collapse. And, and here was the kicker. When that collapse occurred to one or the other, there was a moment of consciousness that was created or occurred or emitted, depending on how you want to describe it. Well, that's, that would be important. So this was the opposite of the idea that consciousness caused the collapse. In Rogers' view, the collapse occurred spontaneously because of this property of the universe. And the collapse caused consciousness, almost like a quantum of consciousness. So he was saying at the end that there needed to be some kind of quantum computer in the brain that would self-collapse by this threshold, but that neurons firing was too big. He already knew that neurons were too big, but he didn't have a candidate for a quantum computer. So Stuart's microtubules would come to the rescue. A moment of consciousness just before we go on to quantum computing. Note, this is an instantaneous, zero time extent collapse, a mathematical event of no duration. Why is there consciousness involved at all? This is pure magic, pure wishful attribution to a math thingy. Note again, instantaneity, in abstract mathematical collapse, state after state after state, there is no continuity at all, never more than one state. How does this support the globality of this transformation? How does any of this explain this, the transforming image of the external world? How does collapse after collapse after collapse equal a coffee, stup, coffee cup and turn stirring spoon? The time extended transformation. There's not even an attempt to explain this. Again, as I said, Stuart and Penrose have never, never understood Penrose. They're undermining the very demonstration of what a proof requires. Penrose gave. Another comment. Consciousness is now a pure epiphenomenon. It can have no causal power. It is created by the material world. As Bergson noted in this framework, consciousness becomes a pure or a mere phosphorescence emitted from the brain like a light bulb. Yet, as we have seen, Bergson and creative evolution showed consciousness was a necessity for explaining evolution. Remember the caterpillar and the wasp is how are you explaining instinct? You know, the idea that the wasp somehow, or the, the fact that the wasp knows instinctively the nine precise points to sting a caterpillar yet keep it alive for its young, or the three precise points to sting a cricket for its young. There's no way that evolution 
evolutionary random steps can explain this before the wasp young dies. So that is, he's, Bergson was saying that consciousness is the impetus behind evolution. For Orc or this, this theory would not be possible. They can't support Bergson. You're going to have to explain the wasp and its instinct by natural selection, random mutations, self-organization. Well, good luck. So Stewart has never left the computational framework. It's just been transformed to a quantum computer. What does a quantum computer actually do in that brain? I fear this is a nice soothing mythology and useless. The problem, in my opinion, begins in that ontology problem, that, that problem that Penrose never actually addresses. Let's put it simply. How are you going to create a concrete, very physical computational device based on superpositions that have no physical existence, like unicorns, that have no ontological status, that exist purely in an abstract mathematical and dimensional configuration space. That is, you're taking unicorns to create a concrete automobile. How are you doing this? How are you gonna create a physical computer from things that have no ontological status, no, no existence? They live in the abstract mathematical space. At best, you're going to find an ersatz substitute, like at the German coffee that uh, they were forced to drink in World War II that Sergeant Schultz doesn't like, made out of acorns or something like that. Thus, as I noted in number 39, the qubit actually becomes an LC circuit that is a piece of electromagnetism, the L being the inductor, the coil, C the capacitor. So the current will run from the capacitor in that direction being pointed, I to the coil, release from the coil to the capacitor, and it'll run in this direction for a while, and then it'll switch and run the other direction. The capacitor is now switch direction from positive on the top plate as opposed to negative. And this will run forever if it weren't for resistance in the circuit. It would simply oscillate as a resonant circuit at a period. So the whole thing in the middle there is our LC circuit oscillating as a resonant circuit. And added is a Josephson junction, which is in essence a resident antenna. Notice it's made out of a, a couple superconductors with an insulator in between, some somewhat insulator. What it does is allow you to change the energy levels, represent different energy levels. So we're looking there at a new energy level of a quantum two-level system, a supposed qubit. Now, this is not superposition. This is ersatz superposition. Again, here's a little picture of a, of a junction, a microwave antenna. Again, in this picture, we're seeing the resonators. Notice different resonators for qubit-qubit coupling and for readout of each qubit. This is all electromagnetism, EM, now quantized to incredibly small units. Here we go, here's a picture of a, a course on quantum computing. Note the um, LC circuit there on the uh, left side of that picture and um, describing its quantization. Here's another view, quantum of charge, 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Uh, down below further, quantum of magnetic flux, 10 to the minus 15th Weber's. So extremely small units, unstable as heck, thus the shielding. Now, a set of qubits, that is LC circuits, cannot move through gates. Normally in the classic framework, you have bits moving through logic gates. At the top there we have 0, 1, 0 being a 2, 
and a 1, 1, 1 being a 7. We're going to move those to the logic gates to add them up to a 9. But in the, this quantum framework, the gates, like the first gate there, the H gear, the Hadamard gate, well, what we're doing is using this, those junctions, so Josephson junctions, and we're directing energy pulses at the uh, qubits, the LC circuits, and changing their state. So the brain is implementing this. And what computations do these quantum computers actually do? I noted in number 39 that my correspondent buddy and I could find no answer to how a QC could do or add 2 plus 3. The difficulty of inputting and representing stably the 2 and the 3 is enormous. And you'll only get a probabilistic answer, a guess. You're going to get a guess as to what two, the answer to 2 plus 3 is. My correspondent buddy found a quantum computer advocate attempting to do 1 plus 2. This was the guy that loves quantum computing. His qubits were simply being used as old-fashioned bits. No superposition being added. He was effectively doing bit shift operations, obviously to old assembler programmers. He was getting a set of answers from which he picked the most probable. It was clear, had he used more bits, he would have gotten even a longer list of possible answers to one plus two that is increasingly more useless. If you cannot add or subtract, you cannot do sorts or searches, comparisons of classic speed to quantum computer speed, as for example, Scott Aronson and his quadratic improvement in some of these cases for uh, quantum are meaningless on these. So what does a QC do? Well, very exotic algorithms like Shor's prime factoring. But Shor requires millions of these qubits. Good luck. To talk of quantum supremacy, these demonstrations are becoming jokes. Folks are waking up to this. One sees Borchards, a field medalist in mathematics, on the teapot test for quantum computers, or teapot supremacy. A supremacy demo show that nothing can compute teapot breakage better than a teapot. In other words, set the test up precisely so your device wins, in this case a teapot. So what does a QC actually do in the brain? And note, all QCs require classic computers to make sense of the answers, to read them out, even to prepare the input. How in the brain is this added? Where is this? Until Stuart can give some reasonable answer that MT slash QC concept has little meaning, he's got some more explaining to do. I took a look at his 2010 Google talk, clarifying the tubulin bit slash qubit. There's tons on microtubule structures, dipoles, proposed superpositions, and collapses. But nowhere do you see how a quantum computer is actually constructed. Like, where are the gates? in the brain, nor what algorithms are actually being computed, nor why these algos are related to consciousness, especially, say, to how a coffee cup is specified. And you're struck with this. How is the reality of the superpositions, which is ubiquitous throughout these talks, so assured when the ontological problem within the measurement problem is totally unresolved? Now, Stewart is asked in the... Uh, interview we started out with, with, can a quantum computer be consciousness? And he says, not the way they are currently implemented, that is, causing a collapse by measurement. You need the Penrose form of collapse. Then, yes, graphene-based quantum computers, perhaps. Again, before we even get started on graphene-based computers, the quantum computers, the question is, what the heck is your QC in the brain actually doing? And how in heck is it implemented? 
So the only physics of consciousness, or or has only the abstract states of computations. It is no model of the image of the external world, thus of conscious experience. This, as I've noted many times, is a physical model where we have a holographic field. Bergson's projection thereof, the photograph already developed in the very heart of things and it all points to space for a matter of memory. And we're seeing the brain as a very concrete resident mass, creating a modulated reconstructive way. What do I mean by that again? I've shown it many times. The, modulate, the reconstructive process in holography, where you're beaming a wave, say a frequency one, to the holographic plate, in this case, it'd be the holographic field. And we're specifying the source related to that reconstructive wave, that frequency of frequency one, the cube. Modulate the frequency two, we specify the object wave from a cup that was related to frequency two. Modulate the frequency three. We're specifying the wine glass, the object wave related to frequency three, and then modulate it back again to frequency one. That's the idea of a modulated reconstructive wave specific to a source in the external holographic field, a coffee cup, a swirling surface, a fly buzzing by, where the cup, cup is right where it says it is in the external field. So is the fly. And the chemical dynamics underlying this wave is specifying a scale of time. A buzzing fly of normal scale could have been a heron like fly on a different scale of time. We could modulate that too. This is, in effect, an optical solution to the origin of the image of the external world. It requires a change in the standard classic metaphysic of space and time. What stands in the way of science seriously researching how this is implemented by the brain? In other words, what stands in the way of Stuart giving it a little more respect than complete ignoring it? Well, firstly, the refusal to look at Bohm's holographic theory of the universal field. Correlated may be causal in this refusal, the refusal to accept Bohm's solution to the QM measurement problem. So firstly, in effect, we're back to the measurement problem. Secondly, the computer model view of the brain as a rigid structure of neurons. This extends even to Stewart's lattices and, and microtubules. When the brain could be conceptualized, rather, as a resonating gelatinous mass under the control of cardinal absorbance, which then would control the various theta rhythms, gamma rhythms, etc., as we talked about in number 57 and number 44 in the context of LSD, which would change that time scale from the buzzing fly to the heron like fly. Thus, moving far closer to seeing the brain as being a concrete wave passing through the holographic field. Unfortunately, this is just the start of the blockage list. So final thoughts. Stewart draws support for his quantum of consciousness, or quantums, from Whitehead's occasions or epochs of experience. He notes this in that, in that their lecture. We saw Whitehead's failure in this in number 53. Here again, to account for the time extended stirring spoon, a surreptitious appeal is being made to an underlying indivisible flow of time, plus a ton of other problems. Again, how are all those beings, discrete, accounting for the continuity, the indivisibility of that flow? Now, Ork or and Stewart tries to achieve great leverage by arguing that shows how anesthesia works, since the microtubules are a purported source of consciousness. The, that stream of instantaneous collapses, anesthesia is proposed to act at the microtubule level, cutting off all consciousness, or cutting off consciousness. Unfortunately, there are other theories of anesthesia. We'll see one next time. So next, we're going to look at pain, feeling, affect, 
the other piece of the hard problem, which will bring in Psalms, Mark Psalms, and relating to Bergson. Because in effect, we're talking, as I said, the other piece of the hard problem. Bergson explains the image of the external world, which is the prior problem, the far deeper problem to get a hold of. But you have the feeling aspect, hmm, good coffee. Together, you're getting the what it is like formulation. Again, I exist, and I've insisted the image of the external world is the prior problem. So we're going to take a, a couple paragraphs that Bergson devotes to this and relate it to Psalms. It's quite interesting and profound. So till then, signing off.